Today's video is brought to you by Bespoke Post. Hey, brother. Guys, how would you describe Neville Longbottom? Clumsy, forgetful, bad at transfiguration, worse at potions? I have to say accurate at times, but it doesn't feel quite right, does it? How about instead Gryffindor, wizard, friend, snake slayer? I'm awesome. Better, better, but personally, I'm particularly fond of samurai. Yeah, you heard me, let's do this. Guys, before we dive on in, I need to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post creates a monthly box of awesome. Actually, they create a bunch of boxes of awesome that all work off of some kind of really cool theme. It's a really nice selection of super cool things, depending on what you're most interested in. Like they've got Birdie for golfers or Terra for like the gardeners. One of my personal favorites though was Carbon. It's a box of carbon-based cleansers for your face. Now, I'll be the first to say that I don't know a heck of a lot about skincare routines, but the mask, the carbon mask that you could like peel off was so satisfying. So needless to say, I have personally been a subscriber to Bespoke Post for a long time. And I think the big thing that got me hooked to begin with is that for some reason, I have always enjoyed getting mail which is probably because growing up as a kid, most of the time, if I ever got mail, it was because it was like a birthday or a holiday. So I always associated it with something fun. But as it turns out, as you get older, a lot of the mail you get is like bills. Oh, so inject your mail with a little extra awesome with a box of awesome. This actually makes a super good gift for that person who's like particularly hard to shop for because you can just send them something random and cool every month for however long you choose. To get started, they have a really helpful quiz at boxofawesome.com that helps guide kind of what type of boxes you'd be most interested in. They come in at 45 bucks a month and are packed with over $70 worth of gear and you can get 20 percent off by going to boxofawesome.com and using promo code super. Again, that's going to be boxofawesome.com, promo code super for 20% off your first box. Be sure to check it out. Link is in the description down below. Uh, samurai? Some of you might be saying like, how do you figure he's not Japanese? To which I say, I will grant you that. Actually, to be completely honest with you, this was not the conclusion that we set out for as we started researching for this particular video, but it ultimately became the only possible conclusion once we learned more. And it all starts with his wand. As we all know, the wand chooses the wizard, Mr. Potter. According to Ollivander, that much has always been clear to those who have studied wand lore. And to me, if I were a wizard, this would be a very comforting and cool idea to be aware of. Like this metaphorical and literal branch of magic has actually like reached out and chosen me. Do you get it? Branch of magic. They're made of wood. Branches are made of wood. Thank you for going on way too long. <laughs> but I feel like this would offer such a huge sense of belonging. Like literally a piece of magic has chosen you. I feel like it would even instill some confidence right out of the gate. Like clarification that you are in fact worthy. But seriously, I don't know about you guys, but I didn't exactly feel like my space maker pencil box made me feel more qualified to take on the first grade. Psych! It was the coolest. It was green and it felt like the pencil box chooses the student, Mr. Carlin. This much has always been clear to those of us who study pencil storage. Plus, just the one wand wizarding world, I had a whole box. Cedar, graphite core, don't wanna brag. Okay, but seriously though, even when I just think about the moment when Harry actually gets his wand, like it gives me chills. It's such a powerful moment. Neville, however, does not get to experience this particularly magical phenomenon into his sixth year at Hogwarts after his wand is broken at the Battle of the Department of Mysteries. Up until that point, he had actually been carrying his father old wand, one that I'm sure that he was very proud to carry, but not one that specifically chose him. And it occurs to me that this could be part of the reason why Neville was struggling just so very much during his early years at Hogwarts. Why is it always me? Now, yes, it is true that wizards can channel their magic through any wand that they are using, but there's also no question that the wand wood and core are critically important to how it relates to the particular wizard using it. especially 
especially if it is changing masters. Ron, for example, also starts off his wizarding career using a hand-me-down wand from his older brother, Charlie, which is made of ash with a unicorn hair core. And here's what Pottermore, or Ollivander, has to say about wands made of ash. The ash wand cleaves to its one true master and ought not to be passed or gifted from the original owner because it will lose power and skill. This tendency is extreme if the core is of unicorn. So yeah, Ron was basically starting out with the worst possible wand wood and core combination available. And yet I don't even think he is the worst in his year at magic. I actually think that still goes to Neville. So this of course leaves me thinking, is it possible or even likely that Neville's wand was holding him back? And I have to admit the tricky part here is that we don't actually know anything about this particular wand, it's wood or core, other than it just belonged to Neville's dad. But we do know a few few things about his father, and we know a lot about Neville in which areas of magic that he excelled at and struggled with. For example, we know that Neville is great in Herbology, that eventually he picks up Defense Against the Dark Arts, and that he was good enough at charms to make it to the NEWT level, but that he also lacks skill in Transfiguration and especially potions. So was there a combination of wood and core that would fit with these particular strengths and weaknesses? I decided to start my hunt with the cores because there are only three and that seems to make it considerably easier and I like easy. And indeed I was correct and it was very easy to pretty much immediately decide that the wand would core in the certain the sometimes my brain is like on autopilot and just goes with the words. It's like I can like turn my brain off and know that I'll keep talking. Yeah. You know? Yeah. What's the danger in that? Good thing we're not talking to the internet. And indeed I was correct. It was very easy to narrow down to almost certainly being a unicorn hair core. Unicorn hair cores are the most faithful of all wands and usually remain strongly attached to their first owner. As for the wood, the first thing that I considered was ebony because it is straight up stated that this is a wand wood particularly used by members of the Order of the Phoenix, which Frank Longbottom was a member of. Ebony is highly suited for combative magic, which would fit because we know that Frank was in Auror, and is particularly good in the field of transfiguration, which we know he must have been good at because it is required in order to become an or on the NEWT level. Felt like my words were going like this on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Ebony is also happiest in the hands of people who are confident with themselves. Now, I can't speak to Frank here, but Neville certainly does not fit that description. At least at first, which is why this wand would not work well for him in the beginning. And even on that note, it does still fit with Neville, who is definitely getting better at magic and more confident in himself as he progresses towards Order of the Phoenix. And honestly, that felt like a really promising option that fit in a lot of different areas. And yet there is still one more that fits even better. Fur also known as the Survivor's Wand. It's called that because Ollivander's grandfather sold three of them to people who survived circumstances involving mortal peril shortly after. And I'm sure that I don't have to remind you, but I will anyway, that Neville's parents were able to survive encounters with Voldemort three times. Now, those are short stories that I would love to see. The three occasions in which Frank and Alice Longbottom and James and Lily Potter evaded death at the hands of Voldemort. But on top of that, fur wands also demand staying power and strength of purpose in their true owners, and that they are poor tools in the hands of the changeable and indecisive. Which, first of all, Neville is not the true owner, and in his first years, he's definitely changeable and indecisive. But honestly, that is to his strength because ultimately Neville needed to change in order to be ready for his new wand. Because upon entering his sixth year at Hogwarts, Neville is finally granted the proper wand that he deserves for the true samurai that he is. And the thing that stands out about Neville getting a new wand is that it wasn't totally necessary. And what I mean by that is just what we said before is that all throughout Order of the Phoenix, Neville is totally coming into his own with his old wand. And I don't really think that anyone would have like batted an eye if his wand wasn't broken and he just continued to use his old one. And yet it was, and he did get a new one. And we learn exactly what wand wood and core that is. 
cherry, and unicorn hair. So why was this an important thing to happen and what does it mean? Well, upon reading the entry about cherry wood on Pottermore, the very first thing that caught my eye is that it is regarded as one of the rarest wand woods. And then of course, out of curiosity, I needed to figure out like what made it so rare and what are the other rare woods? And honestly, I bet I don't even have to tell you what the other three rarest woods are. Go ahead, say them out loud. Exactly! For those of you at home who are like, of course I know, but refresh me. The other three rarest wand woods are of course, Holly, you, and Elder. Wow, 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 look at that. It's Harry, Voldemort, and the Elder one. Who could have guessed that? All of you. But also, Neville, yes. But seriously, like how fitting is that? Like the boy who was almost the chosen one is the one who possesses the other wand wood that is so rare. But the other thing that caught my eye here is that cherry wands are also known for their truly lethal power. And that apparently if you go to the Japanese wizarding school, Mahatsukuro, which I hope I pronounced correctly, and you have a cherry wand, you are regarded with a special kind of prestige. Are you starting to see how this is leaning towards samurai, lethal power, historic Japanese prestige? has a sword, swing, swing. but so what? Like at least some other wizards must have cherry wands and that doesn't make them all samurai, right? And true, Mary Cattermole, for example, actually has the exact same wand, wood, and core. And does that make her a samurai? Of course it does. Tune in next week for part two. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding, probably. But getting back to Neville, the more that I looked into it, cherry trees going beyond the wizarding world of Harry Potter, I found that they have very deep lore in Japanese culture, much of which, as it turns out, shares very certain parallels with Neville. And it all starts with the Japanese tradition of Hanami or flower viewing, which is a several month long celebration that focuses on appreciating the beauty of the blossoming cherry trees all over the country. The trees are extremely beautiful when in bloom, but only remain this way for for one or two weeks. And this pattern of annual fleeting beauty is really the core of their symbolism, which takes two sides, life and death. The continuous pattern of blossoming each year represents life, new beginnings, and revival, which firstly sounds a lot like a phoenix, but second really ties in nicely with Neville, who really does get a new beginning when he gets his new wand. On the other hand, the shortness of the bloom represents death and the shortness of life. And therefore, the actions that you take while you are alive are so much more important because it's such a limited amount of time. And that last sentiment is largely why the cherry tree is the symbol of the samurai because they know that at any point in time, their life could come to an end, just like the flower. And as we bring it back to Harry Potter, the appreciation of death is very important as it pertains to Neville, largely because this is an extremely anti Voldemort idea who was actually trying to conquer death instead of acknowledge it, recognize it, understand it. But of course, as always, the connections run even deeper than that. The other big parallels between Neville and the samurai is the Bushido Code and the folklore of the cherry tree and the 16th day. The Bushido Code is what literally dictated the samurai's way of life. According to Natobi Inazo's Bushido, the soul of Japan is loosely analogous of the European's concept of chivalry, which, hey, is one of the key traits of Gryffindor House. And according to Inazo, the code can be broken down into eight key traits. Righteousness, heroic courage, compassion, respect, respect, honesty, honor, loyalty, and self-control. Which, hey, is like all of the traits of Gryffindor House. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and say it. As far as I'm concerned, samurais are basically the Gryffindors of ancient warriors, or at least their code is. And I think that Neville pretty well embodies all of those traits, which should come as no surprise. I mean, after all, Neville does pull the sword of Gryffindor from the sorting hat, and Dumbledore tells us that only a true Gryffindor could do that. And honestly, we could probably spend an entire video talking about how Neville embodies each of those traits. But for now, I want to talk to you about the cherry tree of the 16th day. The story is about a tree that lived in the garden of a samurai, and he played under it as a child, as did his ancestors before him, as well as his children played under it, as well as their children played under it. But unfortunately, his life was not a happy one and he ultimately outlived the rest of his family and his children. And all he was left with was this one tree, which he loved dearly. And one day it too 
died. Unwilling to accept the tree's fate, the samurai performed Harakiri. Harakiri is a ritual sacrifice of oneself practiced by the samurai, with the specific intent of passing his life force into the tree. He did that on the 16th day of the first month, and every year, like clockwork, it would bloom on that day despite the cold season. It's truly sad, and yet I find it to be remarkably parallel to the ending of Neville's story. Voldemort is entering Hogwarts, the leader of the conquering army, and Neville has lost everything to the cause. His parents, his school, his friends, the war, Harry himself. Voldemort is taking everything he fought for and is there demanding surrender. But Neville refuses. He says he will not surrender and like the samurai is willing to die for what he believes in. Now, Neville in this moment does not realize that Harry is still alive, but how remarkably fitting is it that the very moment that he draws his sword to attack is the same moment that Harry springs back into action. And I just love how this connection between the cherry wood wand to Neville pairs him with this idea of the samurai that works flawlessly right up into the moment that Neville is staring down eminent death. Oh, and did I mention he has a sword? Because samurais have swords. Swing, swing. But there you go, guys. That is what I believe to be the real meaning behind Neville's new and prestigious and rare cherry wand. Let me know what you guys think in the towel section down below. Is Neville a samurai or is he definitely a samurai? Leave all your thoughts down there. But guys, as always, thanks for watching. Be sure to like the video if you haven't already and subscribe so you don't miss any future Harry Potter action from us. If you'd like to see some more information about Neville or how he was possibly the true master of the Elder Wand, you can check out this video right here. But otherwise, guys, I will see you next week.